chapter, that's a great accomplishment. I heard someone they uh, listened to occasionally, and he, he was making a statement that they went through the, the book of Titus and it took them a whole year. There's only three chapters, so, so uh, we're right on course here. So, but anyway, we're going to look at uh, we've been looking at chapter chapter four. As we looked at the whole book, has the uh, the whole book has the premise of assurance of salvation, and really, it's not a mystery. When we die and leave this world, we can actually know that we leave this world and are going to be present with the Lord. One thing we know, religion does not offer that. As a religious person, I never knew that I was going to be with God for all eternity. It does not give you that assurance. But when we're a Christians, when we become believers, we're born into God's family, uh, we have an, that assurance within us. There's no doubt, there's no question that when we face the future, our future is all the same, okay? Unless Christ returns, where are we going? <laughs> we're going to uh, the pearly gates, but our body's going right into the grave, just like everybody else's. And sometimes we don't think about that often, but guess what? Who has ever survived death? Nobody has survived death except uh, two people in the Bible that did not see death. And yet, that is our future. And yet, we have a, sh a future that is secure. There's no doubt in my mind, and should be none in your mind, that when you leave this world, you're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. If you have a doubt, if you have any doubt concerning that, come and see me. <laughs> I'll help you. But no, that's real. You should have no doubts. If you're a true believer, you don't want to go to the grave not knowing if you're going to make it or not, okay? There should be no doubt whatsoever that when you leave this world, that, hey, you're going to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And that's what First John talks about. Also, he talks about, we looked at before, he repeats a thought, okay? He'll, he'll throw a thought there, and then he further, in another chapter, he goes on. This is the third time he mentions the, the issue of love. And here he almost dedicates the whole chapter, chapter 3, to something he's already discussed. It's kind of, he throws it out there, and he begins to unravel it. It gets bigger, he adds more to it every time he discusses it. And so that's what we have in chapter 3, or four, uh, 4. This is really the fourth, third time that he's mentioned this issue of uh, love. The concept of love is not new to John, nor to the, to the New Testament writers. Its very principle is set forth for the nation of Israel. They were to love God, and they were also to love their neighbor. And really, when we think about that concept, we see that one day someone came to Jesus and they asked him, trying to trip him up, what is the greatest commandment? He says, the greatest commandment is this, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And he said, and the second is like unto the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two commandments, notice what he says, upon these two commandments hang or are suspended all the law and the prophets. So as I was reading, I, I picked out some verses this week as I was reading in Leviticus. Le Leviticus, Moses addresses that theme back in Levitic Leviticus 19 and other areas of scripture. Why? Because it is the thread that continues from Genesis to Revelation. It is God's love demonstrated to us in the person of Christ and, and his care for us. And it is also seen in the fact, not only in the fact of salvation, his love for us, but it is something that we are to be characterized by. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. So it is a principle, he said, John says, I write a new commandment. But it's not a new commandment. It's like he's resurrecting a commandment that has been in place for thousands of years. And Jesus tells us, you know what, if you could be ignorant of all the scripture, and I hope you're not, <laughs> someone has said this, okay? 
You see this Bible? This is the second Bible I've worn out, okay? This Bible is taped. On the outside, it's got tape, okay? It's fallen apart. I've taped it in its areas that it is taped. Now I got another Bible. That's the one I read every day. And that one has tape in it already, okay? I'm taping this thing together, okay? And someone has said, either your Bible is wearing out or you're wearing out. Either it wears out and you can take these principles and put them into your everyday life, or your life is a frazzled mess because you cannot function apart from God's word in your life. If you are trying to live, this is extra, if you're trying to live the Christian life apart from reading the Bible every day, it's futile. You will never do it. You need to hear the voice of God every day. Oh, I'm too busy. Well, then you're too busy. Because if you're too busy for God, you're too busy. Because God has made us for a relationship with himself. Apart from that relationship with God, life is vain. It is futile. Apart from that communion that we have, how do you make it when you don't read your Bible or pray? <laughs> or how do we represent ourselves as Christians and we don't share the faith with other people? Maybe at your work. I don't know how you are. But I worked a job where we, where we had 22 workers or 25 workers. There is not one person that did not hear the gospel from my lips. At present, not only do I pray for about 100 people on a regular basis, but there's three people that I'm working on right now, okay? And I'm not jamming the gospel down their throat, but God has placed these people in my life, and as the opportunities arise, I keep communion with, I keep, uh, or actually there's four people. You know, and actually, I'm gonna tell you, so you get the opportunities. So you befriend people for what reason? Just to be a friend? No, we have a goal, we have a goal in mind. What is our goal? Our goal is to bring people to the saving faith of Christ. Wait, how long is eternity? When does eternity end? When do those that are not in the presence of God, when does that torment end? Never. We are here to do God's work. What is God's work? Well, there's several things that are eternal. What is eternal? First of all, God is eternal, right? If God is eternal, we should be investing time in God each and every day, our relationship with him, right? Oh, uh, let's see, God's word is eternal. We have the very eternal word of God. If this is God's eternal word, then we should be spending time each and every day exploring the contents of God's word. It is through this book that God communicates to us. It is through this book that we hear the very voice of God. The last thing that's eternal, what else is eternal? You got God's eternal, his word is eternal. What else is eternal? Yeah, it is, that is, you're right. Didn't think of that one, thank you, Paul. <laughs> that's eternal. You know what's eternal and we need? So you got your investment in a relationship with God. You have your investment in God's word. You know what else is eternal? The souls of men. And we're here to share the gospel with the souls of men. We're here to rescue them. Joe Jude says, plucking them out of the fire, hating the garments that are, are, are spoiled, he says, by sin. But we're plucking people out of the fire. That is our job. That is our responsibility. And if you, hey, are we ashamed of that? Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is uh, the righteousness of God revealed. Do you know where the power is? The power is not in the program. The power is not in anything that we do. You know where the power is? The power is in the gospel. That is the power to convert the souls of men. And that is a message that we should be carrying. I mean, uh, we have people that you have contact with each and every day, and only those people can be reached by yourself. God has placed those people in your life. I'm, I'm talking to someone, who, actually working with someone now that... Uh, they say their brother's a Christian. Oh, you think that's a, that's a coincidence that God hooked me up with this person? 
Or maybe I'm, I'm the answer to somebody else's prayer. And, and we are. People are praying for us or, we're, or someone is praying for someone else. Now, God places us in those steps, in those places. Paul says there's some that sow the seed, there's some that water, and there's some that reap. God hasn't called us all to be reapers, but he's called us to sow and water the, the seed. It is him, God, that brings the harvest. And really, that, that has to be our passion. Our passion has to be reaching people. Is everyone in your family saved? Are your neighbors saved? Are your co-workers saved? Who are you working on? Who are you praying on and actively sharing the gospel with? If we're not, there's something deficient in our faith, okay? Because that is our God-given responsibility. And it should be that which uh, motivates us, really. I mean, to, to rescue people and to bring them into the very same relationship with God. I should stop here, but I'm not. <laughs> okay, I've, I've had 20, 20 people came to me from the city of Chicago, police people, and uh, we helped them get an exemption for the vaccination that they didn't want to get. We've had four, I've had some four city workers. Well, a lot of these people drove 40 miles to come all the way to my house, okay? You know that every there's not one person out of 24 that did not hear the gospel and some future things and some other things. Why? That's our passion, okay? That is what we do. I'm a captive audience, okay? You know that when someone comes and they say, uh, they call me up, do you, does your church do community service? And you probably didn't even know they were doing community service. You thought they were here and now they're not here anymore. You know how many people we've had through these doors doing community service, and you probably didn't even know it, right? They were sitting among us. I said, yeah, we do community service. All you have to do is this. This is all you have to do for community service. You don't have to clean any toilets. You don't have to clean the church. You don't have to do anything except come to church and hear, hear the message, okay? Now I got the captive audience. I said, you, you come to church. I'll give you the credit. All you got to do? Come every Sunday, come every Wednesday, sit there, and guess what? You'll get the credit for community service. It's another opportunity to share the gospel. And so the opportunities that God gives us is sharing the gospel. You see, as we have visitors, there's nobody gets out of this room any Sunday that I see a visitor that does not get the gospel. Why? Because that's what we're all about. We're there to share the message of God. John, 1 John talks about the message of love. We are to love one another. We are to love God and our fellow man. And yet, if we don't share the message of God's love with them, how does the love of God dwell within us? What kind of love is that when we can't even open our mouth? What kind of love is that when we're ashamed of Christ and what he's done for us? Or we're ashamed of the gospel? How can we be ashamed of the gospel when God is... Who are we representing? The God of the universe. The one who has made and created us and everything that exists. And we can't speak for him? Well, what will they think about me? Uh, I'm sure uh, people think a lot about me. But the older you get, you know, you, you know how, how it works. I'll tell you how it works. You don't care anymore, okay? You don't care what people think about you because you are on a mission. Are they think you're crazy or you're a lunatic or some kind of religious freak or you're a Bible banger? Who cares? We're not here to impress people. We're here to give them the message, okay? The message of the gospel. Believe me, there's so many opportunities. I talk to people in the grocery store that I don't even know. I'll strike up a conversation and before I know we're talking about something that is said and all of a sudden that sparks something else and bingo, you get an opportunity. And that's what we should be doing, looking for the opportunities. I remember in seminary, the pastor of the church said uh, we'd have to have six classes with him, but he says, uh, sharing the gospel is like a wedge, okay? You look for the crack, the opportunity, something maybe that is relating to every day, whatever. You look for the crack. When you see that crack, you drive the wedge in, and that's where, you, where you're looking. Look for that little crack, that little opportunity that God gives you to, to say a word for Christ. It may not be a, 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 
the blown out gospel for 10 minutes or five minutes or whatever, uh, but you give them a thought about God that they didn't have. You know, I've had people come even, I say, okay, come, come to Wednesday night, some of these police people. You know what two of them told me? Or three of them. You've inspired me. I'm going to start reading the Bible. I don't know. I hope I inspired the church people to read the Bible. But these people are inspired to read the Bible after coming to one hour, one hour Bible study. You know what? Hey, guess what? We've accomplished something. If they pick up the Bible and start reading it, God's going to do something in their life. We should be inspiring people to get to know God. If we are not inspiring people to get to know God, there is something wrong with our faith. If we are not sharing the gospel with other people, our co-workers, our friends, family, relatives, people we have in contact with, you know, as a new believer, I was a little intimidated. What are they going to think? You know, there's a little fear that holds you back, okay? This passage talks about fear. But, you know, once you get over that fear, guess what? We freely give the gospel. We don't care. Oh, it's not about us. It's not about what they think about us. It's not about if they reject us. They're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the message. We give the message of God. We should never be ashamed to share that message with others. The whole chapter talks about love. John talks about love. Well, if, we're, if we don't share that message, where is the love of God? He says, if you have a brother and you see your brother has needs and you shut up the bowels of your compassion, that you don't meet that need. James says, be warmed and filled and you don't give them those things which they need. Then he says, how dwells the love of God in you? Well, that's, our, that's the physical need that people have. How about the spiritual need? If we withhold the words, there's power in the gospel. God has said, he said, uh, uh, that we are, we are his, not only are we his representatives, we are his, in, his ambassadors, ambassadors, but Paul says, how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. What do your feet look like? <laughs> uh, don't show us, okay? <laughs> don't, we don't want to see them, but... Uh, God says you got beautiful feet. You got beautiful feet if you share the message. If these feet, if these feet take you to someone or some place and you share the message, you know what God says about your feet? You got some good looking feet, okay? But anyway, that's what we should be doing as believers. And really, this concept of love is not foreign to the Bible. We see that we are to love our neighbors. Moses tells us in the book of Leviticus, he sets forth some things under the law. He says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer or a gossip among the people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt what? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Oh, if he is the Lord. Does he have the right to dictate what we should do in our life? If he is the Lord... Does he have any rights in our life? Well, everybody has rights, right? And yet, it is God who owns those rights. He says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I read this verse this week, I've read it many times, but, but, but again, as you read the Bible, something comes off the page. And this verse caught my eye the other day as I was reading. It says, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord. I am the Lord, your God. Does that make any difference in your life at all? That I am the Lord, your God? When is Lord, does he have rights over our life if he is the Lord? Not only is he the Lord, but he is the Lord, your God. 
He says we are to love him, we are to love our neighbors. Paul writes this in Romans 13, 8-10. Eight, eight he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth hath fulfilled the law. So he says, if you love, you have fulfilled God's law. Then he goes on, he says, For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this one saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he gives you these commandments. He tells you, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't covet. And he says, if you want to understand the concept of all these principles, they are based on the fact that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill them. If you, you may kill your kid, but you won't kill your neighbor. But anyway, you're not going to kill your neighbor, right? You're not going to lie. You're not going to cheat. You're not going to defraud. That is love, right? And he says all these commandments are briefly comprehended in this one saying. He sums it all up. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Then he goes on. He says, love, uh, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. John tells us that the source of love is out of God. Where does our source of love originate? It originates out of who God is. God is love. Verse 7 says, Let us love, let us love one another, for, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. So he says, just the fact that we are believers, if you do not have love, he says, you are not born of God, you have no spiritual love. Uh, uh, relationship with God, neither do you know God. Verse 6 says, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Love can be best seen in God's selfless love for us and all humanity. When he, he says, herein is the love of God manifest that Christ came into the world. He manifested that love in two ways. He says, by his incarnation, he came into this world. The God, the God, God became a man, was born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago. He sent his son into the world, but he also sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation for our sins means that he bore our wrath. The penalty that we deserve for our sins was laid upon Christ. He bore our sins. The wrath of God that was poured out upon sin was poured out upon his son. We see that very evident when Christ was on the cross and Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He says, in this was manifest the love of God toward us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, that we might have life, means that we might have life through him. Here it is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now here is where he makes it real and practical in our life, lives. Beloved, if God so loved us, what do you think we should do about it? Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. He gives us an obligation, a duty, our responsibility is to love one another. We are to love one another, he says, and when we do that, God dwells in us. If you love others, he says, God dwells within you. He says his love is perfected in us. Perfected means it reaches the goal. What is the goal that God intended for love? It is that we receive the love of God and we dispense it to other people. When we receive it and keep it, it doesn't reach its goal. When we receive it and dispense it to other people, herein is the love of God perfected or herein God's Love reaches its goal. It is to be dispensed to other people. 
Last of all, he says that God has given us of his spirit. So we look at the source of love is God in verse 7 and 8. We looked at that a couple weeks ago. The manifestation of love is of God. He demonstrated his love. He, he made it visible. In this was manifest the love of God. He made it visible. How is the love of God made visible? Well, 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and he hung upon the cross. There is no greater demonstration of God's love than the cross. The God-man, the eternal God, becoming a man and dying on the cross for our sins is the manifestation of the love of God. Then we see it's the obligation to love is for the Christian. We have an obligation. We ought also to love one another. The obligation to love is for the Christian. Verse 11 through 16. It's not an option. It's an obligation. We ought also to love one another. Today we look at the effect of love in the Christian. So what is the effect of love in us as believers? It really takes a survey of the results of redeeming love, looking inward, outward, and upward. He mentions the benefits or the effects of love in our life, and he focuses in three different directions. That redeeming love making a difference in our life inwardly. That redeeming love makes a difference outwardly. That redeeming love makes a difference upwardly. Okay? And so here is what John sets forth as the benefits of love. Its effects, it, first of all, it affects us inwardly. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Verse 16, he says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. We have known it. We have believed the love that God has to, we looked at it several weeks ago, just the word us. Individually, God has demonstrated his love, yes, to the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But it goes in a little more personal and narrow when he says this love is given to who? Us. Us as individuals. We are the benefactors of this great love, uh, John writes. He says, and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. So he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. The word dwell in the original here, dwelleth, is used three different times. The picture is a continuing, transforming interrelationship with God. God dwells within us. We dwell in God, he dwells within us. So if we dwell in God and God dwells in us, what do you think the, the connection here, God, we dwelling in God and God dwelling in us, would mean for our everyday life? You know what the connection is? Did you have this kind of relationship bef before you were saved? Was God, uh, were you in God and God in you? No, you didn't want nothing to do with God. And if someone uh, said anything about God, it was like, okay, well, we'll tune that out. I, I, I heard three minutes of that. That's about all I can take or... You heard it on the radio, and it's like, start looking for another station, right? We're the jams, right? We're get, get rid of this God stuff, right? If anyone told you about God, what did you do? Oh, tell me more. When someone came to you about God, what did you do initially? Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. You're, you're, it's too much weight here. I don't want the full load, okay? And I'm, I don't want, I don't want any of this God stuff. But now we have a difference. He says, we dwell in God and God dwells in us. What does that mean? We have a relationship with the living God. Isn't that what it was all about from the very beginning? God created a, uh, the heaven and the earth. He created man to live in the garden. And daily God came to Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And he communicated with them. He had relationship with them. That relationship with God was broken because of sin, but restored because of the sacrificial system and the death of Christ. 
What did God do on the cross 2,000 years ago? He wanted to bring us back into a relationship with himself. How is your relationship with God? Are you guys strangers or do you know him? Paul says, I know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. If you pass them down the street, which we won't, but let's just use an illustration. If you pass them down the street, would you actually stop and talk to him? Would you know him? Or would you just pass by? Remember one day when Jesus met two on the Emmaus Road? You know what happened? They started talking to this guy, and they didn't even know who he was. Maybe we'd be the same. God would come into our life and say, hey, have a little conversation here or there, but not know the, 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 uh, the significance of the one who was communicating with us. And so now we have a relationship. That is the effect of this love. To dwell in God is to have one's spiritual root so deeply implanted in him that his life flows through the total person and manifests itself in our life. I mean, are we there? I don't think so, but that's where the goal is, right? We want God in Christ to be manifest in and through us. It is what Paul stated in Galatians 2.20. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, my life is not uh, a part of what I want to do in life, or my ambitions, or my goals, or my aspirations. He says, my life is all about one thing. He says, first of all, I am dead to myself. I am crucified with Christ, but I'm alive. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, not I, it's not about I anymore. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live, I live what? By the faith of the Son of God, who what? Loved me and gave himself for me. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10 and verse 11, the last phrases of each one of those verses says this, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my body. Then verse 11 says that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in my mortal body. It really comes down to what we do. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. The second effect of love is found in verse 17. He says, here in it is our love made perfect that we might have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. This love gives us the confidence as we consider the future. Now he takes our love a different direction, and it's upward. It's now, it was inward, now that love is taken upward. That we may have boldness or confidence in the day of judgment. So there is a present communion with God, our fellowship with him. Also, we have the future result. What is the future result? Probably the hardest thing, it is the hardest thing, it is the hardest thing that any person will ever do. You know what that is? And the most fearful thing that any person will ever do. You know what that is? Someday every person will stand in the presence of God. Every person will stand in the presence of God. At the great white throne judgment, we have Revelation chapter 20. It says the books were opened, another book was opened, which is the book of life. If your name is not written in the book of life, we open up another book. You know what that book is? It is the book of the deeds of your life. What, you have, what you've done from the day that you were born till the day you die, everything has been recorded. God is all-knowing. God is all-wise. God is, knows everything about everything. There's nothing hid from the all-seeing eyes of God. And really a fearful thing to stand in the presence of God. This confidence, though, that he talks about, which flows from an intimate relationship with him, has already been established in our life. We 
uh, who, who is our judge and who, and who we will meet in the future. But see, there's a difference here. We don't meet him as the, we meet, still meet him as the judge, but we don't meet him as the judge that is going to pronounce a sentence of eternal doom upon us. Instead of fear, there will be confidence and an experience of boldness. A approach, a communion with Christ as our judge. It's really a courtroom setting. You enter into that courtroom, you've been there, right? <laughs> Hopefully for nothing too bad, right? <laughs> uh, but anyway, you've been there, I've been there. Did you ever go see the judge? <laughs> You ever hear those words, all rise? <laughs> and this guy comes out of the corner, and you better not be sitting when he tells you to stand up, right? All rise, the honorable, whatever is presiding today, you may now be seated. <clears throat> and then you're sitting there one by one, he's starting to call out names, and you think, you know what? 90 to 30 was a little extreme. <laughs> and he's going to call me up there for that. I've never done that, but. Anyway, we've all done something like speeding or something, you know. But anyway, we stand before judge, the judge. We stand before judge, okay? Now picture another scenario. The kids, the, the judge's kid walks in and he whispers in his dad, the dad's ear, and he says, uh, hey dad, are we gonna go to that uh, football game this afternoon or whatever they're doing? There's a different relationship here. They are both still the judge. But one enters the courtroom as one that is pronounced guilty. We enter the courtroom as one that already has communion and fellowship with God. We enter the courtroom knowing the judge. Yes, uh, and the other guy enters the courtroom as one that is going to get to know the judge, right? We already know the judge. And when we know the judge, we know that he is not going to condemn us because we have a relationship with him. Uh, love finds its consummation, it reaches God's goal, and that goal is the confidence about future judgment, an attitude of confidence and not one of fear. Love dispels all fear of the judge and judgment. I mean, when you, a lot of people, you live the Christian life for a long time. You, you have a desire. God has planted within us a desire, all of us, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You go through life, when you get a little older, it's like, you know, you figure it out. Life, life, life there's not too much in life. Yeah, it's got its frills and uh, different things. But ultimately, there's a longing in your heart to be free from sin and death and tragedy and all the other things life may give us. Uh, and so he says, love reaches his goal. What is its goal? That we come into God's presence with boldness. The next effect of love is the removal of all fear. Verse 18, he says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. John deals with the issue of fear. He tells us that there is no fear in love. We go through, uh, we go through life with many fears. I mean, do you have any fears today? Yeah, probably there's some fears. I mean, that's why the Bible tells us 365 times, fear not. That's why there's 365 days a year. It tells us for each one of those days, we have one of those fear nots, okay? Why does God have to tell us so many times, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not? You know why? Because we are fearful, and God has to reassure us. He's got to calm those fears. And so really, when does that fear start? It starts at childhood and continues throughout all, all life. When you're a kid, kid, what, what, what were you fearful of? The boogeyman. And where was the boogeyman? <laughs> you know he was under your bed, right? <laughs> and so now that started the fear thing, right? And then fears just got bigger and more gripping as you went along in life. But they didn't go away. Now you're not afraid of the boogeyman anymore. But they got bigger. And they got, they got more gripping. Now you have some adult fears. 
Now we extend those fears into the future. We're worried about what's going to be tomorrow. He tells us that this relationship that we have with God dispels what? All fear. When we understand that God loves us, hey, no matter what happens in life, because we, we're looking at the bad things, and that's what we're fearful about, right? The unknown, the bad, the tragedies, this, that, never, whatever. Wait, first of all, let's settle it. God loves us. Second of all, there's nothing that can come into your life that is not allowed by God. So if it's allowed by God, guess what? There's a reason and a purpose for it. You know what we do when, when bad things come into our life? This, I'll show you. Start kicking it back, right? You feel like you're a donkey and you want to kick it out of here. Wait a minute. What, what happened to Job? Job lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost his health. Did God have a purpose in all that? He's trying to figure it out. His friends are coming to him saying, Hey, Job, you're a bad dude, man. You're a bad guy, and God's getting even with you. Wait a minute. That was 2,000 years. That was 4,000 years ago. The first book that was ever penned. Did God have a purpose for Job? How many countless people have read the book of Job and received help and aid and comfort through the tragedy of Job? He had to go through it. God had a purpose. He had to do what God wanted to do. There was no escaping that purpose, but God had a bigger picture. That picture was to reach many with comfort and comfort of God. Remember, uh, Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for good. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God has a bigger picture. Our, you know, the hardest thing for us to do, you know what it is? It's just trust God. We want, we want control. We want to be in control of everything in our life. We want to be in the driver's seat. We want to make sure everything goes our way. We want to make sure the road is smooth, there's no potholes, I hit every green light, I don't run out of gas, I've done that a number of times, but we want to make sure everything is smooth. I think I wanted to see how far it would actually go and I figured it out. So when the needle gets to this point, you better get to the gas station before it gets to this point. So on a lot of my cars, I know exactly where the needle ends, you know, I've been very close and uh, sometimes even ran out of gas. But you know what? We want to be in control. We want to be in the driver's seat and God, step, step aside. I got this, okay? Uh, this is too easy for you, God. I'll take care of it today. And then when you screw it all up, you know what you do? Oh, God, help me. Help me. Unwind my, uh, un unwind my uh, knotted life, right? The hardest thing for us to do is simply to say, God, what do you have for me? My life is in your hands. Do with me. It's dangerous. It's fearful, right? But when he says it has no fear, the, the fear shouldn't be that. What is the, again, what is the hardest thing for us to do? God, here I am. Whatever you want, whatever you want to do with me, do it. No, we don't want to let go of that. Why? Because we don't trust God. We don't think he has our best interest in mind. Oh, wait. He tells us if we have that, guess what we have? He says, love is made perfect. You know what love is made perfect means? It's reached its goal. It's reached its goal and it eliminates all fear. Now we, we, we meet life unfearlessly, right? The things that hold us back most in life is fear. With an everlasting, unconditional love displayed and demonstrated at the cross, Unless we have any doubts about God's love, we are constantly reminded of the cross. Paul says it's the love of God which passes all knowledge. He says uh, that love passes all knowledge. Uh, he says that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, depth, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that we might be filled with the fullness of God. When the reality of the love of God grips you, it will dispel all fear. There is no fear in love, but he says perfect love, 
Perfect love. Love that has reached its goal. There is no fear in love, but perfect love, the, the love that's reached the goal of God, perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. Have you ever been tormented by fear? He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Last, last two is the effect of love. We love him because he first loved us. The next verse says we love God because he first loved us. That is the effect of God showering his love upon us. We love him. Fifth of all, the last effect of God's love upon us is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. And this commandment have we from him, that we love that he loved his brother also. That's it. Those are the benefits. Those are the effects of God's love in our life. It dispels our fear. It, 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 it gives us this relationship with God. It dispels our fear concerning the future and standing before God. Its effect is that we love God. We love others. And it deals with those tormenting fears that we have in life. Tormenting fear. If you have a fear, he says, guess what? If you have fear in your life, he says, I'll tell you what the problem is. You know what the problem is? Your love hasn't gone the distance. You're still short. If you go the distance, the mileage out of love, you know what the end result is? He that feareth is not made perfect in what? Love. If you fear, you know what's missing? experiencing God's love. You're not trusting God. You're not willing to surrender to what God has for your life. You still want to be in control. When God says, hey, let it go. Let me do the work. Let me do what it requires. And guess what? Who wants to go through dif I mean, it makes diff going through difficulty so much easier. If you go through any uh, trial in life, you know what makes it easier? The fact that you know God has placed you there. That God has something to teach you. That God is doing something through, through, he's going to do something through that situation that he may, he, may, he may never even tell you why he did it. But you can trust him and it dispels all fear. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your word that brings help and strength and encouragement to us. We thank you, Lord, that you tell us that you love us with an everlasting love, that you sent Christ to die, and you have demonstrated and reminded us of that love by means of the cross. So we thank you for that. And maybe you're here today and you've never received Christ as your own personal Savior. The message is that God loves you with an everlasting love and that Christ died for your sins. All you have to do is receive what he did for you on the cross. The Bible says we're sinners separated from him. The price of sin is death. Christ died in our place. And by faith and faith alone, we can turn to God and ask him to save us. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Maybe you're here and God has spoken to you about that need. All you have to do is say something like this in your heart. Lord, I realize I'm a sinner. I realize you died on the cross for me. I'm asking you to forgive my sins and save my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing in closing. If you all stand, we'll turn to page 188 in our hymn, hymnal. And we're going to sing the first and last verse of the path of the cross. Page 188. <laughs>
time if he's actually in charge of the mission or if he's stationed now. But he had this, uh, he said he was, uh, God, he knew God wanted him to surrender, but he, he kept thinking, if I surrender, God's going to give me an ugly wife. So he said, and finally he surrendered, and he said, goodbye happiness, a low, ugly wife. And guess what? I saw his wife, and she wasn't bad looking. So we're fearful many times of what God has for us if we totally surrender to him. And there is no fear. Remember, God always has our best interest in mind. Always, always. He's never going to hurt you. He's not going to deceive you. He's not going to trick you. He's going to do the best. You know where it's, where it's hard? I'm going to stop. You know where it's hard to surrender? When you first enter the faith, right? You're afraid. What is God going to do with my life? Hey, you know what? God doesn't want a little part of your life. You know what God wants? Everything. He wants everything. He wants control of everything. And that's hard to give up. But God wants control of everything. Everything in your life, he wants to be the Lord. Wants to be the boss. Can you give the right hand some worship? We all bow our heads and dismiss this morning's service with the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for the message that was brought before us. Dear Lord, we just ask humbly that your hand of protection will be over us this week. Use this for your honor and glory, Lord. We pray that you be with those that aren't with us this morning. Dear Lord, we just pray and trust that everyone who's here this morning receive the blessing, Lord, of your love and your message, Lord. Lord, again, thank you for all that you do for us. Be with our church. Be with this neighborhood. Help us to be a lighthouse here in this community. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.